Welcome to the first of a series of webinars uh, put together um, for the uh, European Geosciences Union, which was held in Vienna uh, in April this year. Uh, my presentation uh, will be on uh, Sentinel data for dummies um, in the context of the Copernicus data space ecosystem. Um, my name is William Ray, and I'm a re remote sensing engineer at Sentinel Hub Gay and Bihar. Uh, so in this presentation, I will quickly run through an introduction to remote sensing and Earth observation. I'll talk about the Copernicus program, uh, some Earth observation applications, and then um, talk a little bit more about the Copernicus data space ecosystem browser. So quickly introducing remote sensing. Uh, naturally, the best way to observe any phenomena is by looking at it. Um, and as humans, we do that with our eyes. Um, and remote sensing sensors aim to mimic this, uh, detecting other parts of the spectrum, uh, as well as the, the, tr uh, the visible light. Uh, remote sensing sensors look at ultraviolet light, infrared wavelengths, um, and also other parts of the spectrum. Um, Earth observation satellites do this on a global scale, constantly observing the Earth's phenomena 24-7. So Earth observation can be defined as the, the process of acquiring observations of the Earth's surface and atmosphere via remote sensing methods. Sensors can be passive or active. So an example of a passive multispectral sensor would be Sentinel-2, and an active sensor such as a such as Sentinel One is a synthetic aperture radar. Uh, these are powerful tools for monitoring physical processes and human activities at all scales. Uh, and after exponential growth in the last decade, terabytes of data is being acquired every single day. This brings me on to the Copernicus program. This is the Earth observation component of the European Union space program uh, and was set up to observe our planet's environment and systems. Uh, it offers raw data and derived products that draw from satellites, Earth observation data and also in situ data. Uh, and it's the biggest e EO program in the world. Uh, the data is open and free to all to use and 16 terabytes of data is collected every single day uh, and this is bringing huge benefits to business and academia in Europe as well as around the globe uh, and this is a key tool in tackling major societal challenges such as climate change. Uh, the Copernicus program currently there are uh, four missions uh, in orbit. So we have Sentinel-1, which is a synthetic aperture radar satellite. This provides all weather radar imaging for land and oceanic applications. Sentinel-2, a multispectral satellite, which provides high resolution imagery, so 10 meters resolution for land-based applications. And Sentinel-3, uh, which provides global land and ocean monitoring services. And in addition, there's the Sentinel-5P, so the Sentinel-5 precursor mission that provides data relating to atmospheric composition uh, and monitors this on a global scale too. So let's move on to some applications. Uh, I've picked an image here in northern France and even just looking at the image, we can see some of the processes going on. So in the bottom of the image here, we have a, a small city. We can see some coastal uh, currents um, here in the second circle uh, we can see the interaction between the sediment coming out from the, the river uh, in this uh, estuary uh, interacting with the ocean and of course there's plenty of farming uh, and agriculture um, uh, in this particular area so we can zoom in on this uh, and you can start to see the benefits of the high resolution of uh, Sentinel-2 uh, we can also look at different parts of the spectrum. So this is a false colour composite. So the red areas here uh, are areas with high reflectance of near-infrared, um, which is a good indicator of vegetation uh, productivity. Uh, you can also visualise this using 
uh, an index called NDBI, so the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index. Uh, and this shows you uh, the uh, productivity and healthiness of vegetation. And if we zoom in even further, taking full advantage of this 10 meters resolution, we can start to see uh, a spatial variation uh, at a field level, which is hugely valuable data. So let's see some other applications. Uh, we have wildfire monitoring. Uh, wildfires can be observed at uh, large scales using satellite imagery. Um, other sources of, center of uh, sentinel data can be also be used to uh, detect the ignition of uh, fires, so such as Sentinel-3, which can use uh, thermal imagery to detect uh, the beginnings of wildfires. And of course, Sentinel-2 can also be used to, to monitor the recovery of vegetation at, after these events have occurred. Uh, in addition, as we've already talked about, uh, satellite imagery is perfect for agricultural monitoring. Uh, its high spatial and temporal resolution is perfect for monitoring uh, the growth stages and healthiness of uh, crop, crops uh, and can assist farmers in rotating their crops on a seasonal and also yearly basis. Satellite imagery is also perfect for observing the extent of snow. Uh, in this example, we're looking at uh, material and I can turn on this layer here where we can see uh, a snow mask which has been generated using uh, the normalized different snow index uh, and this is a great way that satellite data can be used to turn uh, the raw imagery into a actionable product that can be used by decision makers uh, and this kind of data can be used to um, analyze the spatial and also temporal variations of snow coverage in the Alps. So you can compare different years and also different regions of the Alps. Earth observation data is also great for um, observing parts of the world that are remote and difficult to get to. So this is uh, area of interest uh, in the Amazon rainforest uh, in Brazil. And here we can see the growth of agricultural land uh, driving deforestation in Brazil. Uh, and this kind of data actually means that we can now quantify uh, the impacts of deforestation in these parts of the world, whereas previously it was much more difficult to, to quantify this. Uh, you can also measure um, some atmospheric variables using satellite imagery. Uh, so here we're looking at the Iberian Peninsula and this big uh, hotspot in the top of the image where my cursor is. Um, that is the city of Madrid, which has extremely high nitrogen dioxide levels caused by uh, traffic and pollution. Uh, so satellite imagery, again, is a great evidence base for these kind of applications. Uh, as I've already mentioned as well, uh, satellite imagery can create some really uh, amazing uh, derived products. This is the ESA World Cover Map, which is a 12 class land cover map um, generated using Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 data. And here we're looking at Austria. Okay, so you're probably now asking, like, how do I access all this data? And I expect you're thinking it must be really difficult and complex to work with too. Uh, and traditionally, the answer was was yes, um, but things have changed. Things have changed, and the Copernicus e data space ecosystem will make accessing and analysing this data much easier. So, we wanted to contribute to building an attractive European solution to access and process Copernicus Sentinel data, provide users with a long-term perspective, building trust and unlocking the potential of Sentinel data and also su supports European industry in developing high quality competitive operational services. So at its core, the Copernicus data space ecosystem is a data distribution service. Uh, it's open and free under fair use, 
uh, with adjustable capacity and performance for our users. And the, the ecosystem is completely open, uh, although, and there is some complementary commercial capacity too. Uh, and obviously within this, there's a rich data portfolio uh, with all the Copernicus Sentinel data and other uh, CCM core data sets easily available. Uh, so let's have a look at the timeline. So currently the main uh, portal call for many users to access Sentinel data is the uh, Copernicus Data Access Service. So the Data Hub or Sci-Hub, as many people know about. Uh, and currently in 2023, uh, we are uh, rolling out the Copernicus data space ecosystem, gradually phasing this in. Uh, but it's important to note that the current services, so the Copernicus data access service, will be phased out by the end of this year. Uh, so it's really important to switch over to, to the new Copernicus data space ecosystem. Uh, so in addition, here's a little bit more detailed roadmap. Uh, we've just released some additional API supports in April 2023. We have the catalog API, the processing API, uh, connecting into Sentinel Hub APIs. Uh, and additional features are going to be added throughout the year. So in July, for instance, uh, the full archive of Sentinel missions will be available. Uh, and also some additional APIs as well as computing power in Jupyter Lab environments. Uh, so it's really exciting as the ecosystem continuously expands over the upcoming months. Uh, and I encourage you to watch the rest of the uh, webinars which we'll be releasing. Um, for example, uh, my colleague Mega will be demoing the uh, Copernicus Data Space Ecosystem browser uh, in her webinar. And of course, to, you can stay tuned to additional news and information uh, by visiting this link here. So at dataspace.copernicus.eu uh, slash index news. So thank you very much for listening and see you next time.